All right, so good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on the, the webinar. Um, my name is Rob Martin. I work for Simcoe in Vancouver, and I'm just going to go through a little bit of a, an intro here, uh, explain the WebEx system we're using, and uh, introduce our speaker and our topic today. So a few housekeeping things. So everyone, everyone is muted on the call, so we don't get to hear you guys speak or uh, any dogs barking in the background and that kind of stuff. The uh, Q&A panel is over on your right-hand side. If you have any questions, you can you can type them in there uh, as we go through it. We have a pretty packed presentation today, and it should take up most of the time. If there's any questions that are really good, we'll have Ben answer them at the end. But as we go through, I'll be answering the questions through the chat. Um, at the end of this presentation, or after the presentation, we will have a recording available. Uh, that's going to be posted on YouTube and we'll send out a link to everyone and we're going to send out a question answer follow up document after a couple days when we get to go through it. Uh, so our topic today, as you guys probably all know, is CO2 for ice rinks and uh, it's a topic that I'm really excited about personally. Uh, Simcoe did our first ice rink nearly uh, 10 years ago using CO2 and it's still going strong and since then the demand and the interest has just increased over um, over and over, and it's been spreading throughout our country and across all of North America. Uh, so today we've got a great speaker. It's a, a good friend of mine, Benoit Rodier. He works out of our Montreal office, and he is Simcoe's Director of Business Development. Uh, Sim, or, uh, Benoit has been 32 years in the industrial refrigeration business, so he's a bit of an industrial refrigeration veteran and maybe a bit of a nerd. He also teaches at... Um, he also teaches at the industrial or the tech college and the universities in Montreal. And he has spent a lot of time developing and working with the CO2 technology. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Ben uh, to go through his presentation. Thank you very much, Rob. But good morning, everyone. So I'm going to go through this presentation. I have quite a good number of slides. Uh, some portion will be uh, a little bit more technical. Other will be more uh, practical. So trying to reach like every kind of audience attending this morning. So let's start and uh, we have to do a little bit of advertising. So who is Simcoe for those of you that never heard of us? So we started as the Canadian ice machine company. We were founded in 1913 and majorly what we do is install design builds, manufacture service for ammonia, uh, CO2 and any other refrigerants. If we focus on CO2, we've been doing CO2 for the past 10 years. Up to now, we have done over 50 ice rink using CO2. We have also done industrial and semi-commercial system using transcritical CO2 uh, packages and equipment, some cold storage. Uh, we have done pharmaceuticals and we just completed the RSW, which is a refrigerated seawater system on the East Coast very recently. Also on the more heavy industrial portion, we have done a numerous uh, systems using ammonia and CO2 as brine in cold storage. And we have also done ammonia and CO2 cascade system for freezer on a low temperature system. So if we keep moving and we focus on what we are here today, if we're talking about rinks, uh, since we've been around for so long and we've been covering the ice rink market for all those years, we have built, as of today, over 6,000 ice rinks across the world, and it represents more than 50% of all the rink that has been uh, built around the globe. Now, you might be asking, uh, over and above uh, COVID-19 and being at home and having a little bit more time to do interesting things or less interesting things, why are we here this morning? So we want to talk about refrigeration system. We want to mainly talk about rink systems. Uh, we want to talk why or about CO2 refrigeration system for your rink. Is it different or is it the same thing? Uh, what does it mean for you? And why should you choose, choose it or not? You know, is it interesting? Is it something which is feasible? Is it something that could be a good choice for you? And finally, we're going to see what are the key factors in using CO2 into a ring project. So if let's have a look at what is the actual trend 
for ice rink market, what people are looking for, what are we being asked? What's the main criteria in selecting equipment for building a new ring today? So a lot of countries, a lot of people are really focused on being environmentally friendly. So they're looking for solutions which has a low impact on the environment. Uh, a lot of cities, a lot of provinces, a lot of states has requirement in terms of reducing the, their GHG emission and they need to reach certain target by certain dates. So knowing that an ice rink is a big energy consumption building into the city, by being careful in what we're choosing, it's going to have a strong impact in trying to reach uh, those targets. Uh, what people are also looking for is minimize the refrigerant charge and, of course, minimize or even better as absolutely no leakage in terms of refrigerant. They're looking for something which is safe uh, for all users. Of course, one of the main key points is having good ice quality, uh, reduce operating costs, and something that will last for a long period of time that they will not have to replace within five years, 10, 15, or we're more looking for expectation that's gonna last for 25, 30 years and even longer. So if we pick up some studies that has been done uh, in 2000 or around 2000, uh, Natural Resources Canada has made this big study uh, on the ice rinks in Canada. So basically we have 2,500 ice rinks, which represent a total of 2 million megawatt hour per year, which is about equivalent to the energy consumption of about uh, 75,000 ohms. Uh, the majority of those ice rinks are over 25 years old. They need renovations or replacement. They're seeking for reductions in energy costs. Uh, they have a significant environmental impact. And over the past 10 years, 75, at least 75 of those rings using R22 has been changed to something else, to another refrigerant. And new sport complex and municipalities projects are building new facilities and they want to avoid to have the similar issue that they're facing right now with R22, that if they're choosing something that will need to be replaced in five or 10 or 15 years, they're trying to avoid being in that situation again. Now, if we look at the building or if we look at the ice rink building, and it's actually a two competing energy system, meaning that because the building is occupied and we're going throughout seasons, you know, majorly in North, and North America, uh, we need to put energy into the building. So we need a heating source. And of course that heating source has to come for something, whatever it's electro, electrical, natural gas, or whatever is available. And at the same time, we're trying to keep the floor refrigerated to have ice over the surface. So basically we have incoming heat and we also have internal heat generation, whatever is by the lights, whatever is by the people, whatever is by the resurfacer going over the ice, dumping a pile of hot water. And the, the purpose of the refrigeration, refrigeration system, excuse me, is to actually pick up all that heat from the floor and to transport it or displace it somewhere else, to carry it somewhere else. So taking that into account, the same study that has been done by CANMET, which is the Research Center of Natural Resources Canada, they came up with the following a conclusion over a typical ice rink in Canada. So a single rink will have a consumption of about 1.5 million kilo, uh, megawatt hour per year. Uh, depending on where you are, there are some provinces without naming them that has a lower cost of electricity. But generally speaking, the average energy consumption will cost about 100,000 per year. 
Uh, those skating rings, there are 2,300, uh, which are skating rings, 1,300, which are curling rings. Uh, on average, they have about 500 kilogram of refrigerant. They have open compressors, uh, which might result in significant leakage. And uh, some of those rings using synthetic refrigerants uh, as potent, uh, potent greenhouse gases that could have like 3,000 times the effect of a release of one pound in CO2 in the atmosphere. If we look at the total energy consumption of the rink, which is 100,000 or 1.5 million kilowatt hours, uh, there's some portion which is on the left that we have addressed in a previous uh, webinar two, three weeks ago, but now I really want us to focus on the 44% of refrigeration. So out of that 100,000, 44% of that bill is strictly based on the refrigeration system. So now let's really move to what we want to talk about, which is the refrigeration system and the 44%. So let's have a look at a typical NH3 ammonia or R22 industrial buildup system which is probably 90% of the rink in Canada, majorly in every provinces but Quebec. Quebec is slightly different. We have about 60% of those rinks in Quebec which are using R22. Uh, lots of them have been changed and there's still a lot that remains to be changed. So if I go really rapidly, what do we have in terms of system? If we really want to simplify, we have compressors, whatever they're ammonia or R22 or anything else. Uh, those compressors are actually displacing the heat and they're going through a condenser. In this case, it's an evaporative condenser, which is rejecting the heat outside. And then we come back to what we call a chiller. And basically what the chiller does, it's using the refrigerant to actually cool down a secondary refrigerant, which is pumped through the floor and coming back to the chiller. And basically this system has four major parts. Now, I just wanna get your attention that those systems which are using an evaporative condenser, because we are in colder climate, we also need to circulate water to that condenser. So we need a water tank inside and we also need a water pump. So let's move to the still simplistic drawing, uh, looking at what a CO2 system is. So as you can notice, it is very, very similar to what we just saw. It's simple, it's easy to make, it's easy to operate. And actually, if you look at the drawing, it has exactly those same uh, piece of equipment. So we do have CO2 compressors, we also have a condenser outside. We also have a chiller, which is uh, cooling down a secondary refrigerant, which is pumped to the floor. The interesting portion is a lot of time we can do this CO2 system without using the water portion, which tremendously reduce the amount of equipment and also the price, which is related to that and also the water consumption and the water treatment, which is required in order to use evaporative condenser. So now let's focus on some of those pieces included in the CO2 system. So of course the compressor is a very important part of the system. And this is why, excuse me, this is where we are paying energy uh, in our system. So those compressors are called transcritical compressors and they are semi-hermetic. So if I can make a comparison, uh, it, it, it looks and it's very similar to all those compressors used into more commercials application, uh, whatever it's cold storage, whatever it's supermarket industry, and there's tons of those compressors on the market. Because it's CO2, those compressors are rated for high pressure operation. Again, they are semi-hermetic, meaning that the motor and the compressors are within the same casings. They are available in 575 uh, volts for Canada and 460 for United States. They have integral oil cooling, so we don't need to deal with that externally. And right now, there's a lot of suppliers, uh, mainly in Europe, and there's some of those which are in North America. And uh, we have 
those suppliers can provide uh, those compressors in North America with all the requirement in terms of uh, electrical codes and uh, CRN, for examples, in Canada. The product range uh, available in the market right now will range from anywhere from three kilowatt compressor all the way up to 50 kilowatt per machine. And this is what's available right now. Screw compressors are not quite ready for that market. Uh, we know that there's some manufacturer with our, which are working with uh, building a screw compressor capable of handling those high pressure. I suppose it probably be on the market within the next five years. Now, the other piece of equipment, which is actually the condenser, which is generally located outside, and this is where we are rejecting heat that we picked up from the floor, which is rejected to the outside. So if you have a look, this is one example, this is one manufacturer, and actually it's very similar as an air-cooled condenser. Uh, it operates with CO2, meaning that the construction is made for higher pressure, but it actually ex is exactly the same thing as an air cool condenser. Now, what's really important is when we get into transcritical mode, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, this air cool condenser is no longer condensing the gas into liquid, but it's going to be more being a gas cooler where liquid and gas has a very similar density. So then it acts uh, slightly different than what we are used to in typical refrigeration system. Now, going to the options available for your ice ring, there's typically two type of systems which are available. We have what we call the direct system, and we also have the indirect system. So let's spend a little bit of time on those two systems. So we're going to be starting with the transcritical indirect system. So again, we have those, it's a different, it's a different drawing, but we have those similar four pieces of equipment. We have the compressor right there. We have the gas cooler outside. We have a CO2 flash receivers. And then we move into the uh, chiller, which is a secondary fluid cooler. Now, I want to spend a little bit more time on this portion, which is, I think, very crucial for the understanding on what we are trying to accomplish. So what's the main point into an ice ring is obviously the ice ring floor itself and the ice uh, over the floor. So generally speaking, and depending on, on activities and some operator and manager, uh, generally speaking, the ice, uh, we are trying to achieve or obtain or maintain uh, around 20 degrees Fahrenheit, 20 to 21 degrees uh, Fahrenheit on the ice surface. And in order to do so, uh, for some of you who are very quite familiar with heat transfer, we always need a difference in temperature to be capable of catching that heat and actually maintain the ice. So to make a long story a little bit shorter, generally speaking, let's say we have the secondary fluid leaving at 18 degrees. And since it is secondary fluid, so it means that it, it's going to be changing temperature, of course, the length of the rink. So generally speaking, because we need to circulate a good amount of flow into that floor, let's say, for example, that we're going to be providing glycol in this case at 15 degrees and glycol is going to pick up eat all the length of the rink. It's going to end up at 16.5 at the end of the rink. It's going to turn around, it's going to come back, keeps on picking up heat, and then it's going to end up at 18, and then it's going to the chiller. Now, irrelevant if it's glycol, brine, or methanol, or whatever, all secondary fluid will have the same action and the same, uh, same change in temperature. And then from that heat exchanger, we're going to go back to the compressor. And in order to cool down that glycol at 15, we're going to need another difference in temperature between the compressor and this temperature. And generally, when we are designing system, we're trying to keep about 10 degrees different between the compressor and the leaving brine or secondary fluid temperature. So it means that the compressor will be operating at 5 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, let's keep that in mind, and the gas cooler will be operating at about 95 CO2 leaving temperature when the outdoor temperature is 90. 
So let's keep that in mind and let's move to the other side, which is actually the direct system. So we have just about the same pieces of equipment. So I'm gonna focus again on the floor. We're trying to maintain 20 degree on the ice surface, but now we have 18 degrees leaving CO2 because this is a direct system. So it means that we are circulating CO2 directly into the floor. So because it's CO2, because it's a refrigerant, not a secondary one, but a direct refrigerant, we will not change in temperature, but we're gonna be changing in states. So it means that we are actually feeding CO2 in the liquid form and along the length of the rink, it's gonna change from liquid to vapor. But one thing which is really incredible with CO2, it has a very high density. So basically we don't need to pump a lot of CO2 uh, because we all will always have our tubes entirely flooded or the external surface will be flooded with CO2. So it's gonna change from 18 and actually it's gonna change to 18. So there's no change in temperature, just a change in state. It's gonna turn around and come back and still at 18, it's gonna finally leave at 18. And then it's gonna go to the flash receiver and it's gonna go through the condenser. And since we have no change in temperature here, the compressor will be working at just about the same temperature. I'm not considering pressure drop, but pressure drop doesn't have such a big impact on CO2. We will be operating at basically the same temperature of what we are operating into the floor. Now keep one thing in mind, the compressor work is actually to go from one low temperature to go to a higher temperature. Or if we, if we talk in terms of pressure, we're going from a low pressure and it's pumping to a higher pressure to be capable of removing heat to the outside. So less the difference is, less power consumption we can have. So if we go, if we come back to the other slides, we're going from five degrees to 95. And in this case, we're going from 18 degrees to 95. So this compressor will actually consume less energy than an indirect system. So some of you is gonna ask us, uh, you know, is this something new? Is this something special? Well, just to keep things in perspective, uh, direct floor has been used for many, many years. Basically, we had in Montreal about 20 years ago, we had a rink that I remember that was actually using ammonia directly in the floor. There's also, as far as I know, there's still one rink in Ontario, which is still using ammonia directly into the floor. If we move south of the border and we look at the United States, there's a lot of system which are actually using direct R22 into the floor. So another question will be, why should we do that? Well, at the end of the day, which is what is really crucial for an ice rink is actually the ice temperature and the ice quality. So when we are going with a direct system, it means that we are maintaining the same temperature of the ice throughout the entire surface of the rink. This conclude in a better ice quality. So now let's see at the floor construction, if it's really different than other floor construction. So it is slightly different. Actually, because of the CO2 uh, thermodynamic uh, features and properties and density, uh, we actually could do a floor with a much smaller tubing than what we do normally. A normal floor will use plastic one inch tubing and when we do CO2, uh, we're going with half inch tubes. Uh, some of the floor that was done and some of the floor that we have done, uh, we went with half inch copper tube that were wrapped in plastic. We also have done a floor with half inch stainless steel tubing wrapped in plastic. And then your question is gonna be, why should we wrap those tubes in plastic? It's because we're trying to avoid potential corrosion issues or corrosion situation if those piece of piping are ever in contact with a metal surface. So uh, some material specialists are saying that when you do have copper or stainless steel, that's gonna touch a piece of iron into a concrete floor, it might end up having corrosion issues. So to avoid this, this is why we're wrapping those pipings into plastic. 
There's also places where we have on the floor with bare stainless steel piping. And in this case, every piece of steel that was going into the floor was actually coated with something to make sure we were not having steel touching stainless steel. So let's move to the headers. So for those of you which have seen a rink installation, normally headers at the end of the rinks, which are located in a trench, will be in a range of six inch to eight inch. They could be stainless steel, they could be steel, or they could even be P PVC. When we do a direct CO2 floor, those headers will be tremendously reduced in terms of size. We're talking anywhere from two inch to three inch. Uh, we use stainless steels and we actually weld the uh, stainless steel half inch tubing directly into the headers. And you can see here that at the end of the rink, when we are using half inch stainless steel tubing with special tools, we bend those tubes instead of, of actually welding an elbow. Uh, we are bending those tubes, so that tremendously reduces the amount of welding and the potential chance of leakage into your floor. Because it is CO2, those floors and that installation needs to be rated anywhere between 400 to 600 PSI. If we look at the CO2 pump compared to an indirect uh, secondary fluid system, Generally speaking, what we need in pump power, it's about 1.5 kilowatt. We can go with a VFD or it's not even necessary. Now, keep one thing in mind, when we're going with a glycol floor or a calcium chloride floor, you would need a pump that would be anywhere between uh, 15 kilowatt, 20 kilowatt, 25 kilowatt. So this difference in power on the pump represent uh, around 125,000 kilowatt hour per year. Now let's go back to the indirect cooling system. So basically it's a CO2 package. We add one heat exchanger that's going to be a secondary coolant heat exchanger. So we have CO2 on one side, we're going to have glycol or calcium chloride on the other side, and then we're going to have the pump which is going to be a glycol pump or a calcium chloride pump that's going to be, uh, as I said before, 15 to 25 kilowatt. Now, if we look at the rest of the systems, uh, the system will need anywhere between 500 to 625 pounds of CO2. It has the same compressor models. It has the same gas cooler. And we only have a chiller, which is different. And if we're going with a glycol floor, we can go with high pressure, uh, brace plate exchanger uh, direct expansion, or if it's calcium chloride, we need to go to a good old shell and tube flooded chiller, which is going to be direct expansion, meaning that the CO2 is going to be inside the tube and the calcium chloride is going to be in the shell. Now, just to summarize one more time, direct cooling, we have a low pumping power, 1.5 kilowatt. The compressors are working at about minus eight degrees Celsius, which is 18 degrees Fahrenheit. We have incredible good ice quality. All the surface it has is at the same temperature. We have a maximum CUP on the compressors, and we also have efficient heat reclaim if we want to use it. Moving to the indirect cooling system, we have a much higher pumping power. The compressor will be operating at a much lower temperature, minus 15 degrees C or five degrees Fahrenheit. We have a lower efficiency because of that lower operating temperature at the compressor. We're talking about 18% less and we have the same efficient heat reclaim. Now let's see what's happening in the world. So this is the latest, uh, number of CO2 system that has been installed in the world. So I just want to get your attention in Northern Europe. We're talking about 26,000 CO2 system that has been installed. There's about 5,000 system in Japan. Uh, Australia and New Zealand are getting within the 100 system installed. South Africa is now up to 220 system. And if we pay a little bit more attention of what's more interesting for us, Canada is now up to 320 systems, United States, United States, sorry, has 550 systems. But I also get your attention of the same map 
that was published in 2015. At that time, we only had 163 systems in Canada. And in Europe, they were in the range of 4,000 to 5,000 systems. So the point I'm trying to bring is, as you can see, and without making a cynical uh, comparison to what's happening right now, the, the growth is a, uh, basically is an exponential curve, which you can see that all those systems across the world are growing in a very high rate. And this is probably uh, what is going to dominate the market in 10 or 15 years from now. Right now, 50% of the opportunity we are working are CO2 system. Now let's move back to the, uh, basically the ice rink itself and a uh, six factor that should be considered by the owner, manager, investors, uh, municipality people, operator, and everything. So generally speaking, what's important for people, if we look at those six key factors is of course, safety, efficiency, reliability, environment, the cost, of course, and scalability of those systems. So let's see every one of those key factors. So if we start with the environment, so of course, natural refrigerant uh, has been around for over 100 years. Uh, there always been uh, installation that were made this way. Actually, CO2 systems were built and were used about 100 years ago. But we can see that natural refrigerant, which is ammonia and CO2, and I should have put propane, propane is getting uh, very popular as well. You can see that those refrigerant has absolutely no ODP, <clears throat> excuse me, and they have no impact on the global warming potential. So you're gonna say, yes, CO2 is one, it's because the measurement or the reference used in global warming potential is actually CO2. So of course, if you're releasing one pound of CO2 into the atmosphere, it's actually equal to one pound of CO2. If you're releasing one pound of 404, it's equivalent to releasing almost 4,000 pounds of CO2 into the atmosphere. Now, if we move to the uh, safety of the systems, so CO2 is classified as a NA1 refrigerant. So what does it mean? It means it's non-toxic and it's non-flammable. So if we're moving into the letters, if we're going to the A to B, it means that we are increasing toxicity. If we're moving in terms of number from one to three, we are increasing flammabilities. So if we're talking about ammonia, for example, ammonia will be a B2 refrigerant. If we're talking about propane, Propane will be an A2 or an A3. I'm not sure which one of those two, but it's, it's actually going up in terms of flammability. Now let's move to the other side, which is still safety. We're talking about exposure limit. And actually we're talking about long-term TWA expo exposure limit, meaning that it's a, uh, an eight hour exposition, uh, long-term exposure uh, limits of eight hours. So let's see some example. If we're looking at ammonia, we're talking about 25 ppm will be the maximum allowed or the maximum safe uh, proportion of ammonia we will have in the air for eight hours for working. One good thing about ammonia, it's a self-alarming refrigerant, meaning that as soon as you smell it, you will take care of it for sure. Now, if we move to one of the latest refrigerant that has been, uh, that has appeared on the market, that seems to be uh, growing is the R513, which is a mix of R134A with an HFO. And you can see that the maximum exposure for eight hours limit is 650 ppm. Now let's have a look at CO2. That amount of exposure is all the way up to 5,000 ppm. So just to put things in perspective, the actual concentration of CO2 into the atmospheric air, meaning what we have around us right now, what we are breathing is actually 408 ppm, which is fairly close to some of those synthetic refrigerant. Now, of course, as any other refrigerant, uh, CO2 is a, uh, 
could be something which is dangerous. We got to be careful. Same thing with ammonia, same thing with synthetic refrigerant, but CO2 has different uh, properties and we need to take safety measures. So CO2 is heavier than air. CO2, you got to be careful not to trap it, the liquid. Uh, if you ever have a power outage, the pressure will raise in your system. So we need to take action. We need to make sure that if we're not running the system or if we do have a power outage, whatever your system will be rated for high pressure at standstill, or we're going to need uh, something else that's going to maintain the system at a within a reasonable pressure. Uh, without uh, compromising the safety of the personal and the integrity of the systems. And of course, if you ever, <clears throat> excuse me, open up a system uh, that still contains CO2, you might as freeze burn. But we also have solutions for that. So because it's heavier than air, we need a CO2 detection system, but that CO2 detection system needs to be 18 inch from the ground because the CO2 will end up being close to the floor. Uh, to avoid liquid trapping or the formation of dry ice, uh, we cannot have a mains for the safety relief. Actually, we need to pipe every single relief to the outside and we're gonna have the safety relief valve that's gonna be at the end of this piece of pipe and that's gonna be outside. We might need an auxiliary cooling system to maintain pressure during power outage or system standstill. Uh, we need to, cho to choose appropriate material, pipe settings, relief valves, uh, components, and other stuff like that. And as any other refrigerant, we need uh, personal protective equipment, which is gloves, uh, which is glasses, helmets, uh, mask if necessary. Now, talking about pressure and pipe specification, uh, due to this, basically on the good side, uh, because it's high density, the pipe sizing for every CO2 system will be much smaller than any other refrigerant system, including ammonia and including uh, synthetic refrigerant. Of course, because we have smaller pipes, it means that we have reduced costs we have less welding times and materials going to cost less. Uh, we also have reduced costs in terms of thermal insulation. Uh, majorly speaking, CO2 system will use uh, CO, uh, excuse me, stainless steel equipment. Stainless steel is perfectly rated for those operating pressure, which is anywhere between 600 to 1750 PSI. And we can look at the various grade of stainless steel, but generally speaking, this is sufficient and this is one of the best material that we can be using for CO2 system. Talking about maintenance and scalability, uh, something which is really interesting, if we look at those CO2 compressors, uh, they have an interesting range in terms of capacity but when we're going to bigger system, we're gonna need a number of those compressors installed on the rack. Uh, COP can be anywhere up to four and even more than that. Uh, we have relief uh, valves on those compressors and they are built for uh, lower pressure on the suction side and higher pressure on the discharge side. Uh, we also have integral oil cooling, so we don't need to uh, take any actions for that. And one point which is interesting on these scalability sides is you can build a rack with uh, additional space available if you ever project to have an increase in capacity for your system. If you want to build a small outdoor pad, if you want to add a curling uh, sheet of ice, or even if you want to add another uh, sheet into your system, we are capable of building the initial system to be capable of accepting additional compressors and be capable of fully uh, providing the required capacity in the future. In terms of maintenance and redundancy, again, if we compare the traditional industrial open tie compressor, a manufacturer normally recommend overall of those compressors anywhere between uh, five to 10,000 hours. Uh, latest development in technology now, uh, those same manufacturers are saying that uh, 
dose compressor uh, could go now all the way up to 20 to 25,000 hours. If we are looking at screw compressors uh, usage in ice ring technology, those screw compressors also need maintenance. Uh, generally speaking, they will require major overalls anywhere between 40 to 50,000 hours. And if we have a look at those semi-hermetic CO2 compressors, uh, of course we can overall those compressors. But if we practically looking at the cost of those piece of equipment and considering that we have many compressors on your rack systems, a, normally the approach will be to actually have those compressor on the shelf, whatever at the supplier or at your own uh, at your own facility. And if you ever need to replace one of those, you actually swap the existing one in the package and you replace it by a brand new piece of equipment. And it's going to cost less money than overalling those compressors. Now let's focus a little bit on energy efficiency because this is something which is uh, could be complicated to understand, and it actually took me a while to really understand uh, what's the performance of CO two system. So I'm going to start with the very basic, which is uh, the COP. So actually, the COP is let's say we need to absorb heat from the ice ring floor. We're trying to absorb one ton of refrigeration or three kilowatt, which is about equal. And in order to do that, we actually need to spend a little bit of money. So we need to actually put another kilowatt of power into the compressor to absorb uh, this energy. And it actually gave us a COP, which is a coefficient of performance of 3.0. Now, this is something really interesting because this is one of the very rare thing in the world where we are, you are actually getting more for what you are paying for. And if we look at the heat reclaim side, or if we are considering that as an heat pump, it will actually reject what you have picked up plus what you had put in terms of power, and it will give you four kilowatt of heat rejected. So the COP on the heating side will be four. So since we are talking about COP, you can pick any manufacturer uh, compressor software selections. You put your actual running condition, five degree suction, 95 condensing, and it's gonna give you your actual tonnage and your horsepower, and you can calculate the COP of those systems. So those are typical running conditions for ice rinks. And if we look at using ammonia, we will have a COP of 3.05. If we are using R22, it was actually slightly better than ammonia. It was a COP of 3.07. And if we take synthetic refrigerant as R44A, for example, running under those same condition, it's going to be a COP of 2.7. So remember, COP means coefficient of performance but it also means the energy bill, the amount of power you need to put to that compressor to do the same amount of work. So now let's move to the CO2 systems. So without getting into too technical and into the uh, very high detail, but I'm gonna use some word that a lot of people heard, a lot of people understand uh, on this webinars. So when we are operating under the same conditions, Actually, this is a direct system. So if we are using a direct system in the winter operation, we will be capable of running into a subcritical mode, which is the same thing as operating with ammonia or synthetic refrigerant. And you can see that in this case, we would have a COP of 4.69. Now, if we move into the summer operation, we're gonna be operating into a transcritical mode it means that we're passing the top of this curve and we are no longer within this curve. So this is transcritical mode where gas and, and liquid has the same density. So now it's no longer an air cool condenser. It's a gas cooler because we are cooling down the gas. So using the same uh, operating condition as we used before, you can actually see that the COP went from 4.69 to 1.70 during warmer conditions during summer operation. Now, people are going to say, well, why is it interesting? Well, actually, a, a European uh, manufacturer has actually drawn this 
world map many years ago, but I still find it interesting. So we use some information, we call it the bin data, which is actually the number of hours you have during a year that's going to be under that outdoor temperature. So that manufacturer actually draw that blue curve, which is basically stating that anything above that curve will have a CUP, which is equal or better than a synthetic refrigerant performance or an ammonia system. So if we take Quebec, and I just pick Quebec like that as an example, it actually means that running a CO2 system in Quebec will be 18% lower in energy costs than a synthetic refrigerant system. If you get to New York, it's going to be 6% better. And if you get in Atlanta, it's going to be zero. If you look at Northern Europe, Stockholm is Stockholm's going to be 16% less. Germany, Berlin will be about 11%. And something which is really interesting is what by the time passing and with new technology development and advancements, actually this blue curve is going down and we're starting to see more and more CO2 system into warmer area. As I introduced earlier, you can see that South Africa that was in the, in the red portion now is really growing in terms of CO2 system. So how can we calculate, how can we find out if this system is efficient based on my uh, usage and based on where I am located? So there's a lot of software uh, available in the market. Uh, you can do a manual calculation. That's going to be quite com complicated. And you can use the Ben data, or you can use some of those software which are available. It's a third-party software. Uh, I've been using IPU, which is Cap Pack Calculation Pro that has been done in Europe. And this will actually give you the curve of your power consumption using a CO2 system in a very precise location. Now, I just want to get your attention, of course, in the month of July, we go all the way up to 28,000 kilowatt hour consumption for a single rink operation. And I think that was in Toronto. Now, let's move this from a year, year round operation and we move to a seasonal operation, the exact same system, the exact same location, the exact same low profile. And you can see that just going eight months, uh, one, yeah, eight months over 12 months, we actually have 42% less energy consumption. And the, IM, the highest month that's going to be your startup period will go all the way up to 21,000 versus 28,000 that we had before. Now, the interesting thing with a software like that, we can also calculate the performance of a CO2 system compared to other refrigerants. So in this case, I went with a CO2 direct system, a CO2 indirect system. I went with ammonia floating discharge, ammonia buildup system, and I also used like an R44A system. What you can introduce into that software, you can introduce the initial cost of your system. You can introduce the maintenance cost of this system. It's going to give you the annual energy consumption and it will also give you a projected cost of energy over the period of time you're going to pick and choose for your simulation or your business case now if we look at the cost talking about the cost going with an r404 commercial system a condensing unit on the roof with an air cool condenser with a glycol chiller installed into that condensing unit that will be the lowest cost system that you can have in the market. If you're going with an ammonia system or a CO2 indirect system, that's going to be slightly more than this uh, synthetic refrigerant commercial unit. That's about 25% more. And if you're going with a CO2 direct system, mainly because of the floor construction, we're talking about another increase of about 25% in terms of initial investment. Now, if you look at the course over 15, 20, or 30 years, you can truly see what would be the difference in terms of all those costs on a, li on a life cycle. Of course, you need to simulate this system depending on where you are. Are you a seasonal operation or are you a year-long operation? 
Now, talking about warmer climate, there's more and more solutions available on the market which are handling those warmer climate and making the CO2 systems more performant when we get into those warmer climate. So without extending too much, there's a lot of development into what we call ejector. They've been used on numerous occasions. A lot of suppliers are using those ejectors and it is improving the coefficient of performance of the system in warmer climate. If we look at this diagram, which, which is simple, and I don't want to get too technical, but we can add another compressor that will be operating at a much higher uh, temperature that will take care of the flash gas generated during warmer climate and will actually improve the COP of the system. At the same time, we can use this compressor, which is running at warmer temperature, and we can also use it for air conditioning in your building when it's not required for using uh, for handling that flash gas. Something which is getting really, really popular and that we have used on many and many occasions is actually the uh, outside condenser, which is the gas cooler. And we simulate or we do something comparable to an evaporative condenser or a cooling tower. We are actually adding wet pack and we are also piping from the city water where we have incoming water. We will be injecting water on those wet paths and the CO2 leaving the condenser will no longer be five degrees warmer than the outside temperature, but now it's gonna get closer to the wet bulb temperature, meaning that it's gonna be a tremendous reduction into the uh, temperature of the leaving CO2, and this will improve the COP of your system. Now, one portion which is also important is the heat reclaim. So at the beginning, I mentioned that this is a two energy building. We have incoming heat and we are also rejecting heat outside from the refrigeration system. So we've been talking about that for many, many years. Tons of system has been installed using heat reclaim for the refrigeration system. So the main goal is actually to bring back this heat into the building and try to reduce the energy consumption on the heating system. So heat reclaim is actually available with CO2 and it has a very interesting feature. And now I'm gonna to move to this diagram with uh, some of you are really comfortable with. And let's say we are operating at 1200 PSI and uh, we draw the cycle. And if you can look at the bottom table, uh, we actually have three colors in terms of heat rejection. We have the red portion, which is the high temperature heat rejection. We also have the green portion, which is the mid-grade uh, heat reclaim. And we finally have the blue line, which is normally too low on temperature to be uh, usable into an ice ring system. And we look at the proportion of this heat available. You can see that we have 60% of waste. We only have 13% of high temperature and we have 20% of uh, medium grade uh, heat available. If we increase this pressure to 1450 PSI, you can see that actually we draw the table like that. The red portion has increased, the green portion has increased, and the blue portion has decreased. And you can look at what's available in terms of the percentage. Now, if we increase the pressure even more, and this is something which is not uh, which is not something that refrigeration people are used to. Most of the time we're trying to decrease the pressure to be more efficient. But in this case, if we are actually uh, really keeping an eye or focusing on heat reclaim, it is actually really interesting to increase the pressure because now you can see that we have high grade temperature of about 60% available, 20% into the uh, mid grade, and only 22% of waste. So now let's see into our system. So we have our CO2 system on this side. This is a direct CO2 system, but let's focus on the heat reclaim portion. What does it mean to you when you are using a CO2 system? So talking about the hot side available, we can do hot water at 160. We can even do hydronic system between 160 to 180. <clears throat> the green portion, which is the mid-grade, 
still could be used into a mid-grade uh, hydronic loop, which will be uh, taking care of fan coil, underfloor system, uh, in-floor radiant heat, incoming fresh air that could be warm up with this portion. And finally, the blue portion that's going to be rejected to the to the gas cooler will be something which is not useful. Now, let's keep one thing in mind. If we are running at higher pressure, it means that we have a decrease into the CUP. Actually, we calculate it for Toronto. And uh, if we maintain that heat reclaim, we're going to have like 3.35 uh, in terms of CUP. And if we let it float, meaning that we are not doing any heat reclaim and we just take full advantage of the outdoor temperature, uh, then we have a much higher CUP. So basically what it means, uh, it's 30% in reduction in compressor energy if we are not doing heat reclaim. So facility people, manager, operator, and investor needs to keep one thing in mind. They have to look at the overall impact of their power consumption of the entire building on the environment and on the GHG uh, reduction. So I'll give you an example, which is, I don't think it really exists, but if electricity is actually produced by a coal plant and your heating system in your building is done with natural gas, in terms of overall global environmental impact, you would be much better to reduce your energy consumption on the refrigeration systems, not to use the heat reclaim and use natural gas to warm up your building. Finally, of course, which is crucial to systems like that, which is available in the market, is the control system. So people might think that CO2 system is very complicated and different, to and different to manage, but actually it is the same thing. So operator and manager can have access to their six system uh, throughout the control system. What's really important is they need to set up the ice temperature they want. Uh, they need to set up their schedule based on their activity and they can keep an eye on their system, operating temperature, operating pressure, to make sure that everything is okay. If something is wrong, an alarm is going to be triggered, they're going to know right away, and they can uh, actually uh, do what they need to do in the system. Now, the interesting feature with control system, not only do we want to focus on the actual refrigeration system, but we can keep on adding and adding uh, different uh, requirement of the system. In this case, we actually have the heat reclaim portion, which is the high temperature heat going into the uh, potable water system for the shower. And we also have the mid-grade heat, which is used into the building. Now let's finish with some example of what has been done over the past few years, over the past 10 years. So the very first CO2 system and strictly CO2 system that was installed in Canada was in Quebec. It was done in 2011, and they actually replaced an R22 system without heat recovery, and they went with a direct CO2 system in the floor, and it was actually featured into the ASHRAE magazine. I think it was the November 2012 issue. So just to look at the energy costs, so actually the electricity or the power consumption of the system slightly went up, but they entirely removed the propane consumption of that rink. They ended up without not even one penny over the heating system. So it was a global saving of 23% over an R22 system. About eight years ago, we actually replaced an existing ammonia system into the University of Concordia. And it's funny because now we're comparing a CO2 direct system a versus an ammonia system. So they didn't have any heat reclaim. So after six months of operation, they already had data that was quite interesting. If we look for the, those, actually it's five months of operation, they were able to see an ener energy reduction into the compressor by about 300,000 kilowatt hour. And at the same time, by using heat reclaim for the CO2 system, they also had the saving about 100,000 uh, 100, cubic meter of uh, natural gas. 
CANMET, again from Natural Resources Canada, had made a big study comparing every type of refrigeration system. The city of Montreal has over 40 and something rink, all of them using R22, and they were trying to see what would be the best approach and what would be the best system for them in order to replace all of those R22 systems. And Energy Mine Resources Canada actually came out saying uh, to the city of Montreal that actually your best performance systems in terms of energy was going to be a direct CO2 system and it was going to be 24% better than your actual uh, ammonia buildup system. Now, some of the latest uh, systems we have installed, uh, there's a couple we did in Toronto. The latest one was the Barbara and uh, Scott Ice Trail, uh, which is an outdoor pad that was done with a direct CO2 systems. And during the winter time, there's only one compressor barely running to maintain that ice surface. Uh, another system that was done in Vancouver, it's actually uh, North Vancouver. It is a CO2 system, which is installed on a district loop uh, for, a, for the municipality. So the CO2 system is actually rejecting all the heat into a 180 degrees uh, district loop uh, system. And the remain of the waste heat is actually used into the air conditioning system, which is again used a heat pump and rejecting as well that remaining portion into the district heating system at 180 degrees, uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Now, one thing which is really interesting, I'm not sure that any of you have heard about it, but the Beijing speed skating oval is actually being in construction right now. And they have selected a CO2 direct system for that venues. Now, keep one thing in mind for the uh, speed skaters. One thing which is crucial for them is a, the best ice quality and to keep an even temperature on the entire surface and especially in the radius and in the corner. So because of that, and I wouldn't be surprised that we see probably world record broken during that event, they went with CO2 direct system, and it's about equivalent to six to seven entire rings. Uh, they have four CO2 direct package, and they are also using a three CO2 pumping station to serve all that uh, floor surfaces. This is a picture of a couple of systems that has been installed in Quebec and Ontario. Again, you can see the Barbara Ann uh, outdoor skating path in Toronto. We also have another direct CO2 system skating path uh, under the Gardner in Toronto, and those are two CO2 systems that were installed in Quebec. So finally, to summarize, uh, let's keep in mind a few things. Uh, first, uh, CO2 is a natural refrigerant, which is something crucial when we are considering the environment. It's future-proof, meaning that it's been around for 100 years, and it's still gonna be there in 100 years. It is safe because it's classified as an A1 refrigerant. It has, and it could have very high efficiency uh, depending on where you are. And if you are in warmer climate, there are, there are solutions that we can put on the system that will make your system efficient. And finally, it's non-corrosive meaning that it doesn't react with a lot of material, including copper, stainless steel, steel, and stuff like that. So finally, what you need to do is uh, what's right for you based on your plants and what's your own criteria. Typically, the refrigeration plant is part of the building, so you got to make sure that the plant itself can last as long as it needs to. You need to consider all the options and all the factors and maybe CO2 is not the right choice for you. Maybe it's a different solution, which is exactly what you need. You need to ask questions and to make sure that what you're getting is actually right for you. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, if you ever need to reach us, uh, you can join us at the following links. And I think we still have a bit of time for some questions. And you're actually a bit over on time.
we are. We did have, yeah, we're five minutes over, but that's okay. Um, if you want to ask, uh, answer one question, one of the one of the ones that came up is regarding operations staff, and uh, I responded. Um, but maybe in general, you can respond with uh, about operations staff requirements with CO two versus uh, an ammonia system, for example. Uh, well, every every province is and it's different in the states. So I used to be very uh, very well. Uh, I knew pretty much about Quebec, which I forgot because I haven't been spending too much time in Quebec. But I know recently because I've been working in some projects in Ontario, for example. Ontario is very restrictive on uh, what they can accept. So as an example, in Ontario, if we have a CO2 indirect system into the mechanical room and we have an outdoor air cooler, so we have piping going out, uh, refrigerant piping going out, we are limited in terms of horsepower. But if we change that approach and we keep the CO2 package inside the mechanical room and we no longer use a air cool condenser or a gas cooler and we go with a cooling tower instead and a water, con a water cool condenser inside the mechanical room, we can go all the way up to 400 horsepower or I think it's four or 600 horsepower and then we're good to supply a CO2 system for a twin pad operation, for example. Another question that I uh, that I saw was about part loading of the CO2 systems, uh, basically the efficiency under part load and how that would compare to an ammonia system. Well, uh, our strategy over all those rings that we have built uh, is always the same. We don't use part loading on uh, on ring system. Basically, uh, an ammonia system will have two, three compressors. But the strategy is to shut down those compressors when the uh, when the load is not there and restart them uh, when the ice temperature is going up. And it's exactly the same strategy with a CO2 system. So now keep one thing in mind, an ammonia system will have two or three compressors and uh, for a similar capacity, we will have maybe all the way up to six, seven and eight compressors on CO2 systems. So during warmer climate, during the startup of the system, you might have those six or seven compressors running, but then in the middle of the winter time, you might only have one compressor running to maintain the load. So part loading is absolutely not used. It's on off on compressor, and that has been the strategy we've been using for over 50 years. Awesome, thanks, Ben. Um, maybe one more question. Uh, one of the viewers was asking about why stainless steel is used in fabrication of the CO2 systems. Uh, basically because, uh, and it, it, you, you can also have cuppers, but the cuppers will be limited in terms of pressure if you get in, in, in bigger size. So it's actually way simpler to go with stainless steel because stainless steel will withstand pressure anywhere in the systems. And when you have the proper welding procedures and the 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 labor, which is actually capable of welding, uh, it makes a cleaner, a nicer, and a stronger insulation to go with stainless stainless steel uh, construction piping. And also, one thing to keep in mind: uh, you can use, uh, I would say, different type of insulation. So if you use copper or stainless steel, you can go with Armaflex in, uh, insulation and you will never have a risk of corroding that piece of piping compared to maybe using steel where we need to be way more careful into the turbo insulation. All right. Well, thanks, Ben. Um, it's been a very interesting presentation and, and thanks for sharing all this with us. Um, I think that's that's all the time we have, so we should probably let everyone log off. Uh, thanks everyone for, for viewing. If there's any more questions that you wanna type in, feel free. Uh, because we will be putting together some some documentation on this. Uh, and yeah, thanks for your time, everyone. Take care.